Fright Pack Radio, a podcast produced by Winding Trails Media for writers by writers. Writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the right pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host and producer, David Allen Lucas, author of Very Crazy Things. And I am coming up, um, so based on when this will air, you will have missed me at the um, Archon. Missed a lot of us. Uh, missed miss, oh, the, yeah. most of the entire Right Pack at Archon. But um, I will be presenting at the St. Louis Public Library the weekend of Thanksgiving about story structure. And that's yeah. completely free. It is going to be part of our NaNoWriMo events. And with me today, back from the Windy City, is my lovely co-host. Hi, I'm Kathleen Cayembe. I am a paranormal romance author under the pen name Kaseka and Vita and like to do other things, like in this case, go to Chicago and get trained in the Amherst Writers and Artists writing workshop method. So, uh, I'll have a few of those coming up. So, if you're in St. Louis, uh, check it out. Excellent. Yay. With us also is my fellow brother in arms, literally. <laughs> yes, Brad R. Cook, the author of the Iron Chronicles, which is the Iron Horseman, uh, Iron Zulu, and coming this November, so check me out, November 26th at the uh, Main Street Books on Main Street in St. Charles for the big release of Iron Lotus, the oh. third and final in the trilogy. Yay! Yay. Yay. Okay. And, when, and once you're done with checking Brad out, then you come out, or you come out to me and then go check Brad out. Well, either way. No. Okay, with us also is... Melanie Colaney, author of well, science fiction, non-fiction, and uh, fantasy. And I feel like I haven't gotten much, actually, any of that done lately. You've been working on another very important <laughs> project Indeed. recently. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and by the time this airs, it will only be a very couple, only a couple weeks away. Yeah. <laughs> she sounds so excited to get She's married. Nice. It's always exciting to have the wedding over. Yeah. Yes. Well, there are a lot of exciting points leading up to it, and they kind of get to you, though, sometimes. So you think, oh, i got to get it all done. It's not so much the wedding, it's the whole moving thing. Yeah, that. Well, there's no time limit on that. You <laughs> continue to move for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, uh, don't tell him that. <laughs> <laughs> But, anyway, we digress. Also with us today is... Fedora Amos. I write Victorian whodunits, like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis. And my new book, which is up for a Spur Award. I was nominated for Spur Ooh. And Spurs are for... Spur Awards. Uh, They're for Awards. Westerns. And you write mystery. How did this happen? It's because well, there's a train in it. <laughs> you know, there's a, there are a couple of robberies in it. Yeah, I guess it's a western. Yeah, wait a minute. It's, it's got a western title. That's what I really like. Title. Title. It has a title. Title. Yeehaw. And that is Mayhem at Buffalo Bill's Wild West, which is set, of course, at Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, the biggest traveling show ever, ever done. I'm also vice president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime. Yay. And finally, uh, I'm Jennifer Stolzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. I am uh, currently wish I was working on my my premier self-published fantasy story, Threadcaster, that you can check out on threadcaster.com. It should be out next year if I can actually get back to editing it soon. Life sometimes gets in the way. Yeah, it does. <laughs> you hear me mourning. It's one of those things. You say you should be, you, you want to be writing, you'd rather be reading. Well, I would rather be editing. Amen to that. <laughs> and most people hate editing. Uh, I love editing. You love editing? I love editing. Okay. I love critiquing. I love critiquing too much <laughs> because I, I make people sad. <laughs> well, I, I think that's very appropriate given today's topic. Given today's topic, which is... Rewriting, editing, and polishing every scene. And by the way, this is part of, we're also having a wake for one of the great Western writers, Zane Gray. So let me tell you something a little bit about Zane Gray before we get started here. 
Zane Grey actually was a favorite of my father, but that's not the important part. Zane Grey was born January 31, 1872, and he died in October 23rd, 1939. Now, why that's important? Remember, 1939, he dies, right? Well, Zane Grey became the first, or at least one of the first millionaire authors. Think about the time period. A million bucks today is not a million bucks back then. It was a, it's a lot less. A million bucks is getting really high up there. He was able to form his own production company, company for his movies. Exactly. And finance it. So it was, he was a J. lot of money. He was, yes. yeah, he he was, was richer than the Queen. <laughs> yeah, and he had a huge influence on Western writers as well as others. Other writers. Um, I'll read, I'm going to quote somebody in a few minutes. He was also Dwight D. Eisenhower's favorite writer. But something to note here, he died in 39, right? They he had such a stockpile of manuscripts. Think about this, people. He had such a stockpile of manuscripts that they continued to publish a new novel every year until 1963. How on earth did he write that much? I don't know. Okay, apparently, I need to write more. I well, he could write a lot. He could write eighteen pages in a day. <laughs> well, considering the bit that I've read of him, that's impressive. It yes. is. Yeah, no he, matter he what, he doesn't you write. skip on the words either. It's not <laughs> no, like he's no. writing eighteen pages of solid dialogue. The right. thing, though, that we we mentioned uh, before the episode began, his prose is a bit purple. It's Very much a, a bit. A bit, it's more uh, than a bit. It's a little full bit. Full of way. words and descriptions way that are unnecessary so while for it's, story. While it's not 18 pages of, uh, of white a space plot. in between yeah. dialogue, it's not necessarily 18 pages of stuff happening either. Mm -hmm. It might be 18 pages describing prairie grass. Which right. is yeah. the uh, Tolkien well, of the West. Here, here we Which go. Is Hold on. Another, Real quick. All right. At night. When all was dark and still, when she lay wide-eyed and thoughtful under the shadowy canvas, she would be confronted by an appalling realization. Her sympathy, her friendliness, her smiles and charms, of which she had been deri deliberately prodigal. Her love for the children and her good influence on Murdy, all these had, to be had, to had begun to win back Egg from the sordid path that had threatened to lead him to ruin. All right, so. <laughs> yeah. That would be from note. Under the Tom Well, actually, no, before, before you jump on that note, Published in 1925. So let me <laughs> Good point out some things about Zane Gray, and then I'm going to <laughs> turn before over to Before we start note. critiquing him. <laughs> right. One of the things to note about the Zane Gray and the time period, he's kind of considered the father of the Western. But he didn't just write westerns. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. But he was in the middle of the pulp fiction era. And that was getting the books out as fast as you could. I have often, either on mic or off mic, compared self-publishing modern day to the pulp fiction of back then as far as the amount of work you had to do to get the attention that you needed to hopefully become successful. Zane Gray also wrote not only Westerns, but he also wrote two hunting books, six children's books, three baseball books, eight fishing books. He also wrote movies and wrote a TV play. Um, he would go on to write a total of do, 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 56 novels set in the West alone. Now note, I said he didn't just write for the West. So this is 56 Westerns. He would be on the best seller list nine times. <clears throat> Sorry, I was gonna stand and read this closer. It was a it was a top ten bestsellers nine times, which required at the time sales over a hundred thousand copies each time. Now we have changed eras. Our our sale list is higher, but still. As I mentioned before, even after his death, there was a stockpile of manuscripts that continued to be published with a new title each year until 1963. One of my favorite authors, I'm going to quote him, Eric Earl Stanley Garner, you might know him as the author of Perry Mason, said this about Zane Gray. He had the knack of tying his characters into the land and the land into the story. There were other Western writers 
who had fast and furious action, but Zane Grey was the one who would make the action not only convincing, but inevitable. And somehow you got the impression that the bigness of the country generated a bigness of character. And on that note, Kathleen. Did you pick Zane Grey to go with our editing and revision topic on purpose? <laughs> because this sounds, you've marveled at his being prolific, but the other day, I went through all the writing that I did before my carpal tunnel made me stop writing. Uh -huh. So it's been like five, six years since I've been as prolific as all that. Mm -hmm. I edited, I sorted everything into, uh, is, there, is there a draft? If there is an incomplete draft, it goes in one folder. If there's a complete draft, it goes in another folder. Uh -huh. And with my complete drafts folder, I think there were 610 things in it. Of All things. of which, oh, a it's a lot of things. I was pretty prolific, but you know what I wasn't doing at that point? Editing. Uh-huh. So <laughs> the first draft and done. Uh -huh. So the thing, though, is that you don't want all your first drafts to go out into the world the way they are. That's what editing does. It perfects Not things. if you want it a career. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, I have gotten back into writing again now that I can physically, and on the train back to St. Louis yesterday, a week ago, however Couple many weeks ago. ago. Couple weeks ago for you? Yeah. Uh, backwards in time from when this is being... Well, you know, when you move faster than light, our time is different than your time. All right, so yeah. So time travel ago, I was on a train from Chicago to St. Louis, and I was editing a 10,000 word short story. Mm -hmm. And this was not the first part of editing. I started with a draft. I did a lot of writing. I did a lot of editing as I went. And this four and a half hour chunk of editing that I did on the train was the last in a long line of hours editing, hours rewriting, hours re revising. And I got to the end of it finally and was like, I can't even look at this thing anymore. Mm -hmm. It has been too much. I cannot handle this. I sent it to my workshop. Uh -huh. um, but the thing is, I may have missed some things because I did not edit as much as maybe it needs yet. But it took a long time to get it into even uh, a presentable form. You can't just stop when you have the draft done. And if Zane Gray, who was writing as a bit purple, had done all the editing I was doing, I don't think he'd have been nearly as prolific because all that editing takes away from writing time. That's bad. So you can, you can be completely and utterly prolific, or you can have less writing that is done but what is there is polished. So it right. depends on what you want as you're going into your writing. And I'm going to say some plug, Brad, and cut Brad, because you're ready to dovetail into it, but since you asked me directly. One of the things is that remember about the Pulp Fiction era and the time frame in which Zane Gray is coming out initially. We had just had, I'm going to compare him to Jane Austen, we just had the time period of writing in which you have got such purpley prose that we're describing everything like that food they're eating, the place they're, they're eating it off of, and so forth. This is a stepping stone from that time to time period um, writing to something that's closer to modern day. The writing period of Jane Austen and so forth was set because people didn't travel that much or travel that far. So they became sort of travel books. We've kind of talked about that before. This is the stepping stone in between, and I think also a warning sign to modern authors that sometimes looking back, you can admire these authors of, the day, of a past day, but you've got to pay attention to what your modern day audience is looking for. You're right. I said before, this this author is one of my father's favorites. Knows the key word there. Not mm -hmm. mine. Mm -hmm. And what you just pointed out, well, I respect saying great, but trust me, I always was more a Louis L'Amour fan when it came to Westerns, but what you just pointed out is a reason why I never really dove into them that deeply. And with that, I've got Brad and then Fiona. I mean, these books are obviously edited. My guess is they were probably proofread or something like uh -huh. that, especially if he's putting one out a year. But um, to answer your question about editing, or to tap onto that, um, I actually just have now finished uh, two straight months of editing, where I've done little else but edit. Um, in the last month and a half, I have gone through three revisions of my 
novel of Iron Lotus coming out this November. Uh, the first one's on my side before I turn it into the publisher. Then turning it into the publisher, getting their edits back, going through that, and then turning it back, and then getting those back, and then going through it one last time. So three rounds of edits, basically, uh, in kind of an impressive state where we changed a lot. We not a lot, but we, we changed some things around, did some things, and made certain that everything made sense. But that's kind of what this last edit was, was going through and making certain that everything made sense and every, all the edit changes were in there, you know, and had done right, and no ex excess words and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so I've done little else now. Uh, I did in that time also write a 40-page novella, but you know, it's not ready to come out yet. So. Nice. It's getting ready to start its own roundabout. Exactly. That's what I'm doing right now. In fact, that's what I did last night. All right. Uh, yeah, I just, I just want to point out for all our listeners what Brad said and what Jen said, round of edits. Mm. Yeah. Yes. There are multiple rounds of edits, generally, to mm -hmm. get something polished enough to publish. And that's normal. Yep. I think uh, that probably all of this angry novels ought to be given credit to not just Zane, but also Lena. It should say Zane and Lena Gray. Now, who's Lena Gray? Lena Gray was his stuff. wife and his editor. Oh. He, he was a, a, like a manic depressive kind of personality who could not stand to be criticized. He w went out of uh, some publisher's office and clung to a, a lamppost unable to see because of what the publisher had said to him and the rejection that he got. So that uh, it's his wife who did <laughs> all of these, and he personally would just disappear for months and go fishing or have a bunch of mistresses or do something else so, wild. Why she stayed with him, I'll never know. But she edited the books. She was his agent. She sold the books. She kept them until he was dead and published them one year after that's that. That's why she stayed with them, because she was enjoying the fulfilling job that she had. Apparently. Yeah. Well, yes. I guess. She, but was, I think she, she was a was publisher. Half, I think it was a team here. I think if she hadn't been around, he might not have ever written anything that was published. Like it. Well, it, I think you, what you just described, now this is, of course, me writing fiction about him long after he's dead and being unable to confirm this, but we're asking how he was so, uh, you know, how, how he wrote so much. Mm -hmm. How he wrote so much was he would write one draft, give it to his wife, and leave. And then she was the one who put it together. He could write a whole other draft because he did never yeah. go over it and revise anything. It was her job. Yeah. Revising is the hardest thing to do. It is and indeed. I bet you if I were her, sounding from the little bit I know about Zane, she probably didn't tell him anything she was doing to it. <laughs> She changed stuff up, she moved it, she edited it, she gave it to the publisher, the publisher said, this is great. And as far as Zane knew, she'd never touched the thing. That, we don't know, but that very well could be. <laughs> well, it's certainly true that he yeah. did not have his, his eye on anything but Zane Grain, for the most part. That, uh, for example, his most famous book is Writers of the Purple Sage, came out in 1912, mm -hmm. and has since had sold millions of copies and has been made into movies more than once in a TV miniseries. It's a very famous book, okay? Well, this is based upon his original handwritten a, a copy of it, or co copy of it, the original manuscript. And it pans the Mormons in a very big way. Yep. But I defy you to find Mormons in any of the, <laughs> in any of the other <laughs> books to speak of hmm. because they have been excited completely out of it. He did not have his, his finger on the pulse of the public, uh -huh. <laughs> shall we say, that's necessary for a book that's going to uh, actually get out into the world. You just can't do that thing, and you couldn't then. Right. I know a book with Mormons. <laughs> now. It's Sherlock Holmes. It was the sign of four. Or it was one of the very first ones. It's like the first book in the uh, Barnes and Noble collected uh, it first well edition of Sherlock Holmes. I don't remember Mormons in it. I don't, but I don't either. The, the Mormons, there aren't any Mormons to speak the of. The Mormons it, right? were integral to the plot because one of the characters, all the trouble started in a Mormon town or something in America. And then it transferred over to the Okay. Huh. So yes, Mormons! I need that one! Side, Trivia! <laughs> Side note, there are yeah. Mormons, but they should be in literature more. 
and not yeah. villains all the time. Well, Hashtag we villains need diverse just, books. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. For many so, different kinds of diversity too. But some that going back to rewriting, I'm going to avoid that. Wait, wait. Um, <laughs> that what? Just never mind. So yeah. uh-huh. mm-hmm. we'll talk about it. <laughs> Joke away. Um, we won't talk about it ever. Oh, sweep okay. it under the rug. So talk about rewriting, editing, and polishing up. Uh, polishing up. Every author we know has a voice or a style. And so I want to talk a little bit about Zane Gray. And before I'm not a super fan myself, but I do respect the man. I know his influence in the world of a western of writing westerns. Well, he almost popularized it. Yeah. By by himself, really. Because, say, in the, in the 1950s, I just read that there were 300 million uh, books sold, paperback books. Uh-huh. A million of those were Westerns. So he had plenty of imitators, too, like Max Brand uh-huh. and Luke Short, and more recently Larry McMurtry and Louis L'Amour. Uh-huh. And I, there's a Johnstone or something like that, I think, also tries to imitate him. But um, this is what, I'm just going to give you a few things. This is what Zane Gray's style was. And it, what I'm reading to you is from a website of how to write like Zane Gray. Uh, that was a post that was done Monday, March 7th, 2011, by Ron Shear, S C H E E R, um, who is, according to his website, a compulsive reader and lover of film. Okay, what he kind of pointed out is some of the things that was. That, made, that Zane Gray made compelling in the first chapters. He introduces lots of characters and a couple of place names in the first paragraph. Next, he wrote in short, choppy sentences. And the reason for this is, is that is some readers can process only one detail at a time. Wait a minute, maybe at the beginning. At but, the beginning. Okay. And I said before, first half <laughs> she, of readers. She, uh, she said that with the writing book open. <laughs> a compelling first chapter. Okay, provide all the ex- exposition through dialogue. Which, writing radio plays, which by the way, that was happening a lot more, that was building up to that time period. That was, that's how you do that. Um, have characters speak and draw. Nowadays, that's really something you have to be careful with. Hey, I, I got something for that. So this, okay, this is my favorite it. quote out of uh, out of this. I read it earlier. And What's the book it, you're uh, reading, by the way? Uh, as I said, it's Under the Tonto Rim. Good book, 1925. Taint nothing to fall off, but it's hard getting back on. <laughs> Ooh, doggies. <laughs> good, good lesson for life. <laughs> but you can just tell how the character speaks. Yeah. Which that is a trick to writing good dialogue. Draw. Yeah. Introduced a hopelessly stupid character. This will show the superior intelligence of a central character, even though they know little themselves. There's okay. always a bigger doofus. Yeah, there's always a bigger <laughs> doofus. I like that. <laughs> Keep it generic. Don't confuse a reader with details and specifics that might challenge their vague idea of geography and history. And which is good because I've, there's someone else, I'm not going to throw them under the bus, but I remember reading where they had said at, I can't remember the name of the name, I'm going to choose Springfield because almost every state has Springfield. And in Springfield, Nevada, I don't know if that exists or not, it starts off, it goes off to another chapter or something else happens. Now we're Springfield, Mon- Montana. Something was not called an editing. That was not saying great, by the way, people. But that's something you should catch in editing. That is something you should catch in editing. Keep it simple. Yeah, keep... Okay, sorry, I had to check what I was at. Keep it simple. Your characters should all be recognizable types. Readers don't want to re- be reminded that the, that hum- humans are infinitely complex. I don't know if I agree with that. Well, but he, we're talking he about invented great. some. We're talking about how he to invented write. one that's pretty complex, I think. The Lassiter character, okay. which is... The uh, mysterious stranger who comes into town, probably wearing all black, okay. and then read, uh, writes all of the wrongs of the village or town or whatever it is. It like I think he invented some of these characters, which are fairly complex. That one is because he's damaged, and yet he's a good guy in the long run. And then he just made me think of Magnificent Seven. I was yeah, example. Um, of who? Your Jimbo. Okay, yes. It's uh, what uh, the, uh-huh. uh, the Good, Bad, and the Ugly is based on. Uh-huh. Um, 
I was going to say about uh, keep it simple. Oh, your character should not be infinitely complex. Um, Zane Gray, we, we now know from Fedora that uh, his wife did the editing. He wasn't doing anything with his drafts once they were done, pretty much. We don't know that. We don't know. Well. But it would be a guess. I was going to bring up something that editing does for me. My first drafts, because I am a, a hybrid plotter pantser, are not planned out all the way through. I don't have everything solid in my head when I begin to write a story. And often when I finish the story, that's when I go back and I pull things out of certain characters or I realize over the course of the story, oh, this character feels this way about things and that's why they need to do this instead of like that. And that's why they said they were gonna do that and I had to go with it. So I should draw it up in these other places. So revision is a great time for writers who are like me, who do kind of more sketching the first draft to add those layers of complexity those uh, to make the characters individual instead of types, which is how often they start out. Mm -hmm. So how to write like Zane Gray makes sense to me on that level for that uh, particular idea, because if he didn't go back, his characters wouldn't necessarily be as fully fleshed out as they would be had he revised. True. And also to that much on the bread is I need to remember why I just admonished Melanie about is this is talking about the first chapter. And my question now would be is how complex of a character do you want to introduce in the first chapter? Where I'm thinking really the best way to show a good complex character is like an onion. Start off, you've got the outer and they keep peeling away later in the story, layer by layer, and showing how complex they are. And they have to have some kind of arc of growth right. and redemption uh -huh. if they're a bad character or right. development yeah. and growth if they're not. And I do want to highlight that this is how to write like Zane Gray, yeah. and uh, that is one writer's way of doing things, and it is uh, in some ways outdated at this point. So these are not rules for writing, these are just kind of a fun way of seeing what Zane Gray is like when you read his first chapters. Right, which is really why we're not, even though we're talking about some of these, we're not digging in like we do not. Fun with Zane. But you'll still find him in the bookstores and the libraries, folks. Yeah, he still sells books. Hey, I might have to read one of these or something. <laughs> uh, but to, to tag on to what you were saying about editing, I find that fascinating because for me, my revisions are one way of clarifying everything that I'm trying to say. Because I might not, like, I know what I'm trying to say, but does my reader get what I'm trying to say? So editing is, a lot of my editing is that, to make sure that my reader is going to get exactly what I'm trying to show. And then also, to add in like bits throughout the story where maybe you know where I've got a, sh uh, a subplot running, uh -huh. and you know I know that the subplot's there. I don't have to you know change it or anything like that. But I might want to add to it in a scene or something like that. And that's where I do a lot of my editing. So it's not like I'm going through and picking out and realizing what's going on. Mm -hmm. It's more like I'm. I'm, I'm yeah, I always compare it to uh, sculpting, where I'm smoothing out the edges. Uh, and stuff. My editing is a lot of that, mm -hmm. but also I, yeah, when, I, I, find it when I begin a, a longer piece especially, I'll start out thinking the characters are runway or having more the uh, uh, the broad kind of archetypal or recognizable types, they're not archetypal usually, but I'll have more of a recognizable type of person and as the story goes on, their complexity in my mind is developed by the events of the story and I realize more about their backstories, their histories. So those are all get woven in as the story progresses. Uh -huh. But then when I go back, I have to add those things that I now know to the earlier sections and sure. to make sure everything lines up. Right. I think that uh, Brad has a, a really important thing that I attempt to do because you get to know your own shortcomings as, as you do some editing. Mm -hmm. And one of mine is that I don't add enough sensory cues like smell, taste, touch, hearing, seeing, so that those are things that mm -hmm. I know I'm probably lacking and I go back and try to put some more in to enrich it. I try not to put them in places that just make them stick out like something silly, but that will actually help it to become a little bit deeper and a little more complex. I'm dovetailing in, though, this is something I do, you don't have to. Half of what I do, people don't want to do anyway, so, but I have this exact same weakness that you're talking about. Um, and what I will do is I will go through a chapter, or actually I'll go through my entire long piece, and I will highlight or I will change the color of ink 
for each of the five senses. And then, so in other words, like maybe smell is yellow, sight is something blue, you get the idea. And then I will stop reading after I've done that and just look page by page. How much of any one am I seeing? And is it a regular mixture? If it's not a regular mixture, that's just right off the bat. Hey, I'm too much visual, which that's actually my, my weakness. I am really a really visual writer. But I'm too visual and don't have enough texture here or smell or taste or whatever. One of mine I have to give credit to Angie Fox for. She's mm -hmm. the one who pointed out to me. It's uh, that I often will have an action happen and it's important to the story and I just it's two sentences and you move on. Mm -hmm. Not it's, developed enough. Yeah, it, yeah, she's like stretching mm -hmm. out. You want to stretch out those moments that are important. You know, instead of just writing a sentence or two about, you know, that moment, stretch that moment out into a paragraph, a couple of paragraphs, maybe even like, you know, most of a page. And that's a lot of what I'll end up doing in editing is I'll see that this moment, which is a really cool moment, is very short. And, you know, you had lead up to that moment, you have exit out of that moment, but the moment itself is, you know, just a little chunk of the page. And so I'll go in and then I'll expand it out and I'll talk more about the feelings and the smells and, the, you know, the sensory you know, side of that. Maybe find something that I can draw out a little bit more. And, you know, when I'm writing in my head, it's a moment, so it's a moment you spend and move on. However, as a reader, you might want time to slow down in that one moment for a second, so you can kind to of- To savor it, yes. To savor it, exactly. exactly. So yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the things I always do when I edit. That reminds me of something that uh, writer Andy Duncan said in one of my clarion classes this summer. He pointed out that something that a, a bunch of us were doing um, with our stories it was, we would have, you know, a sentence, and he said, a lot of you are writing in one sentence what could be a scene, a really important scene, and like add tension. And so his example was, um, these uh, two kids are riding their bikes up to this gate that has a gate opener. One of them has a gate opener, and they open the gate and go in. So they ride to the, they open the gate, ride their bikes through, go in. And, what he said was you could have an entire scene of them riding to the gate how are they feeling what is the ground like they're they're not supposed to be there this is not their their area so how are they feeling what's it like riding the pedals up the hill and then you press the gate opener because you're going fast toward the gate the way that you did before when you were in a car and the gate doesn't open and the gate doesn't open you're getting closer and closer and closer and you're worried you're gonna have to skid out to the side and the gate doesn't open, and the gate doesn't open, and then finally you get an idea, you put it high so that sensor can see it, and the gate opens just as you're going through. Going with that, I, that was perfect, and I'm, going, I'm skipping um, one of the things that was written there, which the one I'm skipping just real fast, makes it into some multiple syllable words, now to what you're talking about. Feel free to over-dramatize. Now, that doesn't sound good if you're outside of writing, but listen to what this uh, what is said here. When he was, the, don't say, when he was done talking, no one spoke, which is what you're, kind of, if you think about it, if you're only writing a sentence or two about something that could really be expanded, you're saying the same thing. That's, that's too matter of fact. Say, his ominous reading, I'm sorry, his ominous reasoning had a silencing effect upon his hearers. You're going deeper. Now, yes, it's still held into a sentence, but you're building on the building on the tension, building on the scene itself. And you, it doesn't matter if you make it a whole paragraph or, but that's what, that's something you need to revise. I kind of lost where I was going with that. <laughs> you're okay. uh, I want to uh, take a moment to highlight the fact that so much of what we are reading here and we are talking about Zane's strategies. Uh, he's exceptionally passive voice, uh -huh. yeah. which is not something encouraged when writing uh, modern day. Yeah. Modern day. Uh, take that sentence that you just quoted. Uh, his ominous reasoning held a silencing effect upon his hearers. Uh, how can you restructure that sentence to be more active? Uh, his, uh, the hearers grew silent in the ominous whatever, um, the, as, re, as the, the sense of his reasoning settled ominous over them. 
words. On this reasoning, like, silence like, his hearers. Oh, that was even yeah. easier. Yeah. <laughs> silence his audience, I guess. Their mouths clamped shut. It's then, uh, it's more engaging in general and less purple in general to switch right. to an active voice as opposed to a passive voice. Now, passive voice sounds a lot like a told story because humans speak in passive voice. But narrator voice is more active because the narrator is supposed to be engaging you and drawing you through the story at a pace that you want to continue, not at a kind of stuttering, sad, you weren't there, but let me tell you about it pace. Right. Didn't you have something to do with zombies that was a way to tell whether a sentence was active or passive? Was that you? Uh, yeah. You you put by zombies at the end, let okay. you know if you've been telling, if you if you've been telling a passive sentence because it's got the action at the end instead of the beginning. So wait, I want an example. Uh, which one is, which one it buys on? Yeah, example. Um, I don't know. You can't do it with the one that we just read. Okay. Um, the ball was hit. I yes, by zombies. So that one's what? Active or passive? Was is passive. So if it can, if it works with by zombies at the end, it's passive voice. Yes, yes. because the actions at the end of the sentence. Otherwise, you just say John hit the ball. Okay. Then you can't put John hit the ball by zombies. That's, well, I mean, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. If it passes zombies on the way. Well, in all fairness, to old Zade, he used action verbs plenty. Mm. Here's a, a nice little passage, I think, from uh, Writers of the Purple Sage. It's about uh, a horse race. So with his passion to kill, still keen and unabated, that's the horse, actually, <laughs> Venters lived out that ride and drank a rider's sad, sweet cup of wildness to the dregs. When Wrangle's long mane, lashing in the wind, stung Venters in the cheek, the sting added a beat to his flying pulse. He bent a downward glance to try to see Wrangle's actual stride and saw only twinkling, darting streaks in the white rush of the trail. He watched the sorrel's savage head pointed level, his mouth still closed and dry, but his nostrils distended as if he were snorting unseen fire. Wrangle was the horse for a race with death. And one of the things we, exactly, one of the things that you remember too, as we're talking about Zane Gray, and I go back and, and I threw other authors into this, we're talking about the early days of, in this case, the early days of the Western, we also have early days of American literature who will become popularized. Yeah, I wouldn't no. say that. Of the very popular mass market kind of stuff, maybe. That's what I'm going with my statements. Okay. Yeah, I'm not talking about the higher brow, so I lack of a better way of saying that. I'm talking about the Herman Melville stuff. Right, exactly. That's the Herman Melville. So I'm talking about the books that would literally fit into the pocket and be carried around either by soldiers or by travelers. The, from the, the dying novel kind of onward. Right. So this would be kind of in the Middle Ages, I suppose, of the, that trend. Mm -hmm. Because they had been around since actually a little before the Civil War. Right. You said Middle Ages, I just suddenly thought it was much older. Yeah, <laughs> a little different. <laughs> Some of the things that he would throw into his stories was melodrama, humor, Um, sorry, I'm reading another part of the password time. Okay, mostly melodrama and humor were thrown constantly into his stories. And you can hear that sometimes in the way he's writing. But you're right, modern day authors don't write like Zane Gray. In fact, even a lot of his contemporaries didn't write like Zane Gray. But there was something always about his stories that seemed to fascinate readers and do today. And that's one thing, you know, despite everything we're saying and we're pounding on Zane Gray as far as, hey, he's outdated, whatever, that's still attracting readers to him. Well, I think it's the mythology, really, yeah. of the Old West. Actually, he didn't start it. It was, I think, Owen Wister in The Virginian who did, mm, okay. who had gone out west. He was a sickly guy, and, and he went out west in the, the West Helium. Uh -huh. And from that, came this mythology that there were healings to be had from the great emptiness of the far west and then of course you never have a vacuum so what comes into it but 
good guys and bad guys, and they're going to clash. Right. And created then the myth of the Old West, which really never existed when you get right down to it. Very true. And then you had a bunch But it's of a myth that we can buy into, and still do. I mean, mm -hmm. what, what are most of these space odyssey kinds of things except Western set space? The final yeah. front space. The, the final, final frontier. frontier. <laughs> we're celebrating the 50th year of Star Trek. Of Star Trek, Trek yes. Um, Firefly. Space Western. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Or let's go even with a modern law enforcement western. Sure. And this was, it was the books originally written by Elmore Leonard and now became, the TV series is over now, but justified. Modern day western. <laughs> and it's appealing for a lot of reasons, but I think one is that you have a clear cut difference between the good guys and the bad guys, and you don't have to wrestle with the gray that we have to live with in our politics and every other place in our lives today. Hmm. So going back to the main topic though, we've talked a lot of things. Do you, do you have some in Jan? Okay. Um, what are some things that you do when you go through your rewriting process and your revising process? And most importantly, and this is really aimed at all everyone who's published, is sitting around here or getting ready to be published, when do you decide that you've polished enough, polished it enough. Now, when I say that, I'm really glad we use the term polish because there's a military term called polishing the cannonball. And let me explain that. When you're polishing the cannonball, what that is referring to, I'm going to use a cannon, is you are lining up the sights just perfectly, and if, oop, I'm just a little bit off, let me get back over here, okay, no, 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 no. And by the time you finally take, think you can finally take the shot, you've been shot. So, with More that... importantly, you're just trying to hit the side of a giant ship and right. aiming is only so much of the matter. Exactly. So... Because um, it's moving. Brad, you get your hands Target's up moving. and then I'm going to go to Jen. Uh, well, um, it's funny you talk about polishing. Uh, I, to be honest, uh, I like the term that my book is never finished. Mm -hmm. um, it's just abandoned. Yeah. Um, because the reality is, is I can keep editing probably two, three, four, five, six more times. At least. Um, come up with new things to twist here, find a sentence that I'd rather rewrite this way than that way, you know, something along those lines. But at some point you have to acknowledge the fact that you've done it. The book is good. The book is, you know, really good. It's finished. It's, it's, good it's enough. finished, you know, and you send it out. It's not that it's good enough, because, you know, I'm, I'm proud of that book. But could I go through and tweak a word here, or maybe drop out that, that, you know, sure. Um, but it's it's finished. It's ready to go. People are going to love this book, despite the fact that you know there might be uh, you know some bad sentence in there that's like three words long. Huh. Um, but my process is um, I, I start off with two things. So I've written the book. I know the book. I may have probably gone through it, sending it off to my critiquers. When I really sit down to edit it, I generate a list of everything that I know that I want to touch. Maybe it's something in the end of the book that I came up with that I decided it needs to be in the beginning of the book too. You know, any long thing. So it's generally going to be half to three quarters of a page of notes right there. But I don't necessarily go through and do all those notes at that time. What I then do is go chapter by chapter. And I go through each chapter and I work each chapter over and I'll add to that list of things that need to change, you know, things that I start to notice as I go chapter by chapter. And then at the end of that, once I've gone through all, you know, however many chapters there are, I will then go to that list, take that list, and then do that through the entire book. And it does a couple of things. So one, I've gone through the, mi the macro of my book mm -hmm. and the micro of my book. Um, and that'll pretty much catch most things. Um, and then one of the other things that I find that it does is it allows me to catch things throughout the entire book. Uh, funny story, um, just went through Iron Lotus and the owl in Iron Lotus actually changed genders throughout the book. <laughs> sometimes it was a she owl, sometimes it was a he owl, and that was me going back and forth as I wrote the book, not certain which one I wanted it to be, and then I changed the origin so that changed the gender too. And uh, I noticed it when I was editing, so it was one of the things I added to the list, and at the end I went through and changed the gender to what I wanted, which was a she. 
Um, so, you know, it was, it's those kinds of things that I might catch on doing a chapter by chapter thing, but I know for certain when I do a universal search, I'm going to catch them all. Um, since I'm editing right now, I'm not editing with the help of a, a publishing house and a given editor from them. I have hired uh, my cousin Catherine, who is an English, um, she's almost a graduate, so we'll skip her that. <laughs> um, so I have a degree in English. Yeah. She's, she's been studying English and English structure for very uh, in-depth. And I trust her, even if she is still a student and she hasn't edited a whole lot of novels, I feel like she knows what she's doing with uh, making sentences. So I've I hired her to do my final go-overs. And I'm using that, that money that I'm spending on her and, the, and her time as my, it's done. Because after she's looked at it, I would be stupid to change it. Because I'm going to mess it up. She's already gone through and checked it all. So, uh, leading up to that point, I, all, I wanted to make a note that I'm doing a final revision through, and when I revise on my computer where I typed it, everything looks wrong. Like, everything's wrong. Uh -huh. Why did I pick that word, I'm an idiot? That, uh -huh. that, that wrong. But when I'm reading it in my printed version that I got using lulu.com, uh, the printout version, I'm reading it, and it's fine. Because it's printed, and it's found in a book, and it feels concrete and real, and it's there, and it looks different. And I've also been removed a step from fixing it. That's just the way it is. And it's not perfect by any stretch, but the number of edits I do with my pen in the printed out version, which is the reason I bought the printed out version, versus the number of edits I do when I'm looking at it with my keyboard uh, is vast because I've gone through and rewritten an entire chapter from scratch and then read it in the book, you know, in the pre the version I didn't read, and it was fine. I did all of that work because I didn't have my galley copy with me, and I probably only needed to, you know, rewrite this paragraph here, change the sentence there, get rid of that dialogue tag, get rid of that dialogue tag. It was mostly fine. There was nothing wrong with it. But the mindset of staring at it on a computer screen versus the mindset of staring at it in print, that's enough to make me feel like everything's terrible, let's change it all. So keep that in mind. Sometimes it pays to edit on paper. Mm -hmm. Actually, you're raising a question I'm going to come back to. Mm -hmm. But you came up that I'm going to let Melanie go first and then I'm going to ask that question. Yeah, I was just thinking, when you're studying, when you're editing a, a series, you also have to think about consistency between books. Because I was reading a multi-book series, and there were some secondary characters in it. Uh, they were the children of the sister. And I say the children because the oldest one was a girl, and the second one was named Taylor. Mm -hmm. And I'm almost sure that Taylor was a girl in the first book, a boy in the second book, and no, a boy in the first book, a girl in the second book, and a girl, in, uh, a boy again in the third book. That's confusing. Yeah. Just why you keep a, a Bible of yeah. stuff for a series. But this you particular, can't again, Taylor's a unisex name, and this book actually had co authors, and so between all those things, they couldn't keep straight. It's, and Taylor it's was easy. Uh -huh. girl. It's easy which to is, lose as track. Fedora was saying, it's always good to have a series Bible, mm -hmm. which I think we did an episode on. Go look through our yeah. list, mm -hmm. tell us your what a series Bible it really is and how to use it. Um, I've got a question for everybody, but Brad, you had your... I was just going to tack on to what she said, because what you're saying is very true. So Iron Lotus is the third in uh, a series, um, and when going through it, there was uh, there were a couple things. So one, my editor and I got into a disagreement about how something should look, and I was like, I understand where you're coming from, but this is the way it's been for two books now. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, I... You know, it's too late. Yeah, it's you can't those, change it now. Exactly. You know, it's, it's one of those, it, it kind of needs to be this way for consistency. And mm -hmm. whether it's right or wrong, uh, I'd, I'd prefer consistency, Yeah. Or, you know, uh, over that. But yeah, it's, and then there are other things where I go back through, like uh, I couldn't remember if the little dragon in my book had uh, actual scales or if he had a leathery skin, because I describe both types of dragons in my book. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't certain, so I read back through, 
And, I, and actually, I found out I did not describe it in uh, Iron Horseman, mm. but I did describe it in Iron Zulu. Ah. So mm. it was kind of funny. It was like, went back to the first book, read through all of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. You, you word get, search get a word dragon. search in exactly <laughs> on the, on the files. Um, and had not ju- touched what his you know skin was like in Iron Horseman, but had done it in Iron Zulu. So that allowed me to get it right for Iron Horse. Mm-hmm. The door and then I'm going to raise this question on the whole bunch of Go ahead. Well, my system, <laughs> I suppose, mm-hmm. is, is rather radically different than any of yours. Because what I do is edit, as I go along, chapter by chapter, at the end of each chapter, one thing that I do is write a chapter summary so that I don't have to look for things so much. <laughs> and, of course, all the time that I add a new character, I always flesh out something about them in part of the Bible. But what I do is... I know a lot of my own weaknesses, and I, at the end of each chapter, I go back through that chapter, and and I try to put in more uh, sensory cues, for example, is one thing that I do, and I try to uh, make progress, make sure that I made some progress on all fronts in that chapter, whether it's character, plot, theme, conflict, that something actually happens in the chapter that's worthwhile happening there. So that I do not keep drafts and then go back over them. I change it then. If I'm not making it better, then uh, what kind of a writer I am? I? So I don't keep any old stuff. Okay. I just do it chapter by chapter, and at the end, then I'm finished and I'm ready to try to sell the thing. And the next time I look at it is when an editor tells me to. Tell me what I need to do with it. Of course, you know you're not writing a series either. Oh yeah. Yes, yes. Oh. Yes. The Jemima McBussell series. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, they're all related. They have the same protagonist. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Quinn, and by the way, yes, Winding Trails Media, or rather Winding Trails Theater, will eventually be airing a uh, radio play based on Jemima Jem- McBussell. Yes. yes. Um, and a real event. Your, and I'll a be doing event. your cover, by the way. Yes. Wonderful. Jen is doing, Jen is doing the poster art. And I'm, Fabulous. And I, last week I was talk, just got started working on talking about the music lay, laying down the tracks on the music. So it's, not, it, so it's in progress. It's in progress. Well, that's exciting. Thanks, Dave. You're welcome. Unfortunately, none of this is probably going to come out until spring of 2017. I was hoping for fall this year, but uh, production you're a busy takes guy. time. I know. It, yeah, does. it does. It does. And I'm learning on that aspect. But anyway, my question to everybody um, that I've been holding on to, and thank you, Jen, for bringing this up. Because yeah. obviously now I am definitely not the only one who does this. Who in here must read their works printed out and to be able to edit it best? Uh, I've learned the value of getting it printed out for many reasons, but for editing reasons especially, uh, because of what I said earlier, uh, and just because I know my tendencies. It's more me keeping myself in check than me being unable to edit it, because the fact is I love editing. I love looking at my word soup and stirring it all up. <laughs> Are you fevered over there? No, fevered? I'm not fevered. Oh. Um, I love that stuff. I prefer it to the blank page vastly. And mm-hmm. it's one reason why it's taken 10 years for me to finish Threadcasters, because I am doing what Brad mentioned earlier. I am, I am not finishing it. I'm abandoning it. Yeah. I'm going to abandon it in the best state it can be so it can stand on its own legs. Sure. And I guarantee that when I open the book again next, you know, in the next couple years or whatever, I'll find a sentence that I would re- rewrite. But I'm rewriting it not so much because it's wrong, but because I'm doing a word swapping kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I could have said it this way and it would sound more literary. Or I could have said it this way and it would have been more effective or punchier. And the only reason that that is an option is because it's in that plastic state of being on a Word file, a Word document. And it's so easy just to back, 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 rewrite. Oh, yeah, I'm, I feel so calm. Oh, my endorphins, they feel so good. Or you have it printed out in which you can't go back, 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 back. You have to look at the words that are on the page. And if they're in English and they're in the right order, generally in my brain when I read them, they're fine. I'm a little bit different than you on that. I have, I do have to see it on a printed page that can really edit really well. Mm-hmm. But unlike some of what you were saying there, my problem is on the computer screen, 
I tend to miss the forest through the trees. Mm. I tend to miss the problems, or that's where I'm reading it, and I know what I meant to say, so if I mentally say it, mm. there. When I have it on paper, there's just something about it that, I'm, that lets me be able to cut through it and be able to see more and see the problems. I don't know why. Uh, Brad, then Kathleen, and then... Yeah, so, so what Jen just said there, actually, I wanted to add to that. Mm -hmm. um, I guess you will go through the finished book and you will find things that you will want to change. Every author, I think, does this. However, the beauty part of that is the reverse. You will also go through and find passages that you're like, damn, that's pretty good. <laughs> and I wrote that. I, I, I might not believe that I wrote that right away, but in the end, you, your name's on the front of the book, you realize, oh, I really did write that. <laughs> um, however, so to the editing thing, I edit off a computer. I don't like editing off paper. It's a... It's a step that uh -huh. I used to try and do, that back and forth and everything just annoys the heck out of me. <laughs> um, you know, I, I like to I like to narrow like work as efficiently as possible. Uh -huh. um, it's one of the things that I really like to do. It's why I don't do a lot of the like color changing stuff and everything like that. Um, I really try and have you know straight, forced myself into that. But I will admit that hitting send or seeing it in print uh -huh. is the greatest editing tool in the history of mankind. Yes. <laughs> because nothing will make those errors pop off the, the page or the screen as when it is now in an untouchable form. Uh -huh. So either when it's in print or if it's a blog, once it's up and everyone else can read that horrible mistake too, um, they jump off the page at you at that point. So I completely understand this process. Uh, but I really have trained myself to try and see them, uh, you know, on a computer screen. I do a combination of both. I find when it's an earlier draft, I prefer to do it on the computer um, because there's more that I will be tweaking and changing while it's relatively new. But as it gets closer to um, being ready to go out, like when it's as good as I can get it, I try and print it off and read through it one last time just to see, is there anything I've missed? And I find that um, I will do certain kinds of edits more often on paper and other kinds of edits more often, more, more changing, rearranging things I will do on the computer, but more kind of uh, macro level stuff, more, more larger level stuff, um, it's helpful to do um, on paper. So something that I do to make sure I get the macro stuff mm -hmm. in the first edits, like I'll go, I'll read through it. I'll try and read through it as like one in one go and, um, make comments to myself in, uh, in the document. Like, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I brought this up later, but it needs to come back or this ties in with something that happens here. Highlight this. Um, and I won't do a lot of edits. I'll just do notes to myself for things that need to be changed because when I get to the end, I may feel differently about some of those things. Um, and that's kind of, that's more the level of things that I do when it's on paper too. Um, and then it, again at the end. Like, is there something typo-wise that jumps out? Do I think I really address this problem well enough? Things like that, but I do both. That was wordy. Okay. That's what we edit. Ah, oh, I see what you did there. Thank you. I no no no. Do make editing. You never see what they did there. Go on. I make a printed copy, but it's for critique, mm -hmm. so that uh, other people can give me some feedback, and I may or may not change whatever they say. Also, at one of my critique groups, I read it out loud, and I think that's a good thing to do that's too. It definitely yeah. is. That's why, in, as I've said before, one of the reasons to ever do an open mic, which I don't like. I'm not a f personal fan, but I do recognize it's pluses. And that is one of the things that sometimes that's the only time you can hear where you've, how should I say, overwritten something, or used the wrong word, or you've missed up the right basic. Or your sentence, or it, sentence, structure sentence just, just doesn't make doesn't any make sense. sense. Yes. Or you can't pronounce that dialogue you just wrote. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. All good stuff. So, final last thoughts on writing, editing, revising, polishing. Please do it. 
Please do. <laughs> yes. I will say this. This, this is something that, um, for those of you who are out there that are independent published, what I mean by that is mostly self-published, that is probably the biggest hurdle to getting the attention that your story needs. I have often heard people who have said self-publishers don't, don't edit. And I know self-published people who edit the wazoo out of it. So please, you, get, you have to treat your work like you're getting it professionally published outside of your, outside of your control. In other words, like Random House. Um, you want to look as professional as everybody. So oh, absolutely. Revised. I would think so, too. And one of the things I do before I turn my work over to an editor is I've revised like crazy before I get there. Well, you can take, uh, take a, a hint from Zane, mm -hmm. from Mr. Zane Gray, Find yourself an editor that you trust implicitly. <laughs> there there you them if you can. Marry your editor. There you go. And, uh, or maybe she just took and, over. And you know what, sidebar? I'm going to say this real fast. I'm talking about Earl Stanley Garner and his quote. And his quote. He did marry his editor eventually. Go ahead. But the, uh, you, you, you marry them, maybe not as literally uh -huh. as the examples provided, <laughs> but uh, get... You know, you, you find someone that you trust their opinion and who understands your book, uh, get them to be your critique partner slash editor, and uh, don't don't just assume that because you wrote it, it's perfect, and don't get uh, hurt because your value is diminished because they found a problem in your draft. The, the fact is that you made this thing to, as best you could out of nothing but thin air. And to have it fall perfectly into place the minute it tumbles out of your brain is unrealistic. And having someone that you trust look at it, that helps so much when it comes to revising and editing. Because if you don't trust them, then everything that they say to you is going to sound like BS. And with that, I'm going to end with one of um, the ending, actually, of Zane Gray's The Border Legion, which actually really doesn't have anything to do, but it's kind of just fun with this. Then all I say is, you did right to drive me off. Only you should never have trailed me out to the border. Ah, but Jim, in my fury, I discovered my love. Have a, and with that, have a great week writing. Tune in next week for yet another interesting tale in the writing industry. In my fury, I discovered my love. I you pissed me off so bad, I can't live without you anymore. <laughs> Dude, I should have read mine. It was but you know what? Minutes. You know what? Great. That reminds me of The Force Awakens. We're, we're oh, so, you're, you're a choice. so hold on. Are you telling me that you're a, a Ray Kylo Ren shipper? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> think about okay. think about what Han Solo was telling uh, Leia. I Leia, Leia always said, "I hated to see you go," and Ra and Han goes, "That's why I did it." Uh, oh God, this is too good. Okay, here she we go. Just one little atom in a vast world of struggling humans, like a little pine sapling lifting itself among millions of its kind toward the light. But that lifting was the great and the beautiful secret. Uh, and I know this really was the end. Thank you for sticking around. And oh please God. listen to the ads and so forth to follow. Have you ever written an audio play? Have you even considered writing one? Visit www.windingtrailsmedia.com because currently we are looking for audio plays to produce. Again, that is www.windingtrailsmedia.com and visit calls for scripts. And while you're at it, please sign up for the newsletter and you will find that icon at the bottom of every page. Did you know that Right Pack Radio has an international audience? How would you like to reach that audience in regards to your books, your book services, your author services, or more? Go to www.windingtrailsmedia.com and look under advertising for more information. If you don't have a script, that's not a problem. We will be happy to work with you. Once again, go to www.windingtrailsmedia.com for more information. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.